Hey guys, so today we're going to go through a different style video. Rather than getting into our technical demonstration, we're just going to lay out some best practices in preparing for our camera network. This is very important to do before you order any equipment because you have to make sure everybody's on the same page before you have some sort of threat happen against your organization and then it's almost too late to figure out that you were not prepared. So the first thing that we're going to do is get our stakeholders together, everybody who's involved, key decision makers in the business, and just go through these questions together. And the number one thing that we need to ask is, what type of threat do we need to protect from? And a lot of us will default to the break-ins and, and physical theft of, of items, of if it's like a computer or cash or something like that. Those are quite obvious. But you may also have to extend further, uh, depending on your business or organization's operations. Uh, for example, like uh, in the case that I'm doing, I'm installing this for a church. So there is a there are separated rooms, and it's adults with children. So we need to protect against physical and sexual abuse from the children, uh, and then we also have a number of entrances and exits that we want to cover. Just keeping tabs of who's coming into the building, who's leaving, it's always good to have a record of that. And then also on your business as well is it's good to have some sort of perimeter. Uh, so if you have like a parking lot and you have uh, a lot of customers parking in there, is there any liability for you on that? Uh, those are very important areas to cover. But that's not always the best thing to just start going buying all these cameras. We have to prioritize our risks and then invest the dollars onto the risks that are the biggest threats. And so if you're going out buying a $200 camera to protect the one and only $200 computer in the far corner of the building, that may not be a good use of dollars but it would be if that $200 computer has some very important data on it. So you have to go through the actual physical cost and the intangible cost itself. And another thing too, as we're covering more of the perimeter situation, if we're doing outdoor cameras, we need to take into account what's the temperature going to be, what moisture levels do we have to worry about, and how bright is it going to be outside. Because that will determine what rating of camera we will need to make sure that we're putting in a stable solution uh, and that it's not failing on us at a critical time during a storm or anything like that. Once you kind of figure out those areas, now start to talk about how often do we need to record these events. Uh, so you can have your cameras just for viewing, so it does not record anything. You can have it record on motion, so if the camera detects motion, uh, it will then record that event and store it or you can just have it record all the time. Now, if you say, oh, I'm just gonna record it all the time, and even if you had bought a very large hard drive, uh, that's great, it will work, but remember, if you have 20 cameras writing to the same disk 24 seven, that's going to hit your disk speeds pretty hard, and it's also going to drain your network as well. So make sure you're not saturating your network and, and pushing off everybody else because you're recording everything at the same time. And for every camera that you add, it's only going to multiply that value for you. And then once you kind of figure that information out, that's where you come back to your disk storage requirements. The more cameras you have, the more events that you hold, obviously you're gonna to have to have a bigger disk. So as you can see, these questions are very important because once you have the answers from everybody involved, the definitions for this is going to be very straightforward. It will tell you exactly where you need to place your cameras, the number of cameras, the types, and when it comes down to your NVR, exactly what performance you're expecting and the disk size you'll need to make sure that you're keeping these events for the time that's required. So once you're complete with your discussion, come back and just jot down the notes that you discussed on where you're going to place these cameras. And you can see that we had a few outdoor cameras and we have a number of indoor cameras. But you also notice that I have different types of cameras here. So I have a, a G3 on an indoor, I have the G3s outdoor, but I have the domes on indoors as well. 
And the reason why I did that is because if you go back and look at the Ubiquiti's camera offering, you can open up all these in different tabs and we can look at that the G3 is indoor and outdoor rated and uh, that's very important if we need to have it outside in the cold and also uh, with the moisture protection. And it also has an infrared, uh, well this is the extender, but it also has infrared capabilities for nighttime. Now the G3 dome also has those infrared capabilities, but you can see the number one thing that they market on this product is the wide angle. And I felt like that was a really big requirement on some of the rooms. And looking at some of these other ones, there's a G3 Micro, which is more wireless, which frankly I wouldn't really recommend on a production environment unless if it was very challenging to run a cable there. Uh, and then you get into the G3 Pro, which is a little bit heavier duty for the outdoor stuff. It's got better uh, optical zoom, but also waterproofing as well. And then there's the Flex, which is also indoor-outdoor, and they call it the Flex because literally there's a ton of different ways that you can mount it indoor or outdoor. So what I did is I just looked at these two cameras because I felt that was the best for the budget and also what we were trying to achieve. But looking at the number of cameras that we have, I didn't just order all of these at once. I bought one camera and then had it sent to me of each type and then I took it around the building on a pole and got a solid feel of what it looks like in the actual environment that I'm trying to protect. And what's nice is when you buy these devices they come and it does not require the NVR for you to test the picture. All you need to do is just plug it into your switch if it's powered over Ethernet you can plug in directly or you can use the power brick that it comes with to power it on and then you can just go and if we just open up a new tab and just do 192.168.57.221, this is the IP address of the camera that it received. So if I do UBNT and then the default password of UBNT, you can just open up a direct connection to that camera and see exactly what it will look like once you install it. So I went around to every single spot and uh, tested this out. I tested on different walls and made sure that we had the best angle for everything and then once I had everything kind of tallied out I came back and looked at the ordering side of things. So if we look on Amazon you can see that the G3 goes for $200 but we have a five pack that goes for $764 and if you divide that out that comes just a little bit above $150 uh, before any shipping or tax or anything like that. So the reason why they do this is because if I order an individual camera it will come with that power over Ethernet brick. Now with the 5 pack it does not come with that power over Ethernet brick. And that's very important because if you do not have a switch that's capable of powering these cameras you will not be able to power them on at all. And so if we just do a quick Google search for Unify PoE, and this is the article I'm looking for, and I'm just going to do a Command F and look for video, we can see the exact power over Ethernet methods that are supported. So looking at the G3 is its passive 24 volt, and then there is the 802.3AF and 802.3AT. These are usually auto negotiated and once you plug in the dome it will work. So uh, unfortunately for the G3 camera itself you're going to have to do some sort of configuration but that's fine because I have that on my 48 port Unify switch. So let me just show you what this looks like. Right now I have my switch running and all I did is I plugged in an Ethernet cable from my cameras straight into my switch. And now looking at my controller, I can go into clients, and after they've had a minute or two to boot up, I can sort by name, and I can see that my security cameras are, I only have a few of them online. So I have three, four, seven, and eight. So looking at my list, I have three, four, seven, and eight. Now you can notice these are all the same models, 
And that's because those G3 domes auto-negotiate which PoE method they prefer. And all the G3s are waiting for me to configure those devices. So switching back to my controller, or my network controller I should say, let's go into our devices and then let's pull up the switch. And you can see that I have all of my cameras kind of plugged in this area. That's how I organize my patch panel. And so I have 2, 4, 10, 12, and 18. This is my range from 18 on left um, where all my cameras are. And you can see the ones that are dark are the ones where the G3s are plugged into. Now it's very important that you have this correct. If I select these ports, so I'm going to do 2, 4, 10, 12, and I have 18. You can see these are all highlighted in blue. If I set these ports to 24 volt passive, and there is a device like a computer or some other device that does not support this level of voltage, it will fry the NIC card on that device. And trust me, I've learned that the hard way. So once you have these ports selected, and I'm just going to triple check here, 2, 4, 10, 12, and 18. I'm going to change it from power over Ethernet plus, which is those, uh, those 802.whatever standards. And we're going to come down here and hit edit selected. And we're going to create a new profile for these switch ports. So I'm going to go into manage profiles. And so this is a new beta feature. And we're just going to hit add new. And let's call this 24 volt passive PoE. And we're going to modify that so it's 24 volt passive. And it's going to have some options here of what's your native network. That's going to be my LAN. And then we have our tagged networks. Now this is going to be more for uh, VLAN tagging. I'm just going to do a select all just in case for some reason I plug in a 24 volt item that needs to be uh, on the guest network. I'm just going to do that so I don't have a headache later on just because I forgot to check that. So I'm going to press save here. So I have my profile created. I still have yet to assign it to these ports. It just says connected. So I'm going to hit the drop down. I'm going to switch it over to 24 volt passive PoE, the profile that I just gave this, and I'm going to press apply. And now this should switch to provisioning, and this will take a minute for it to provision the device, but we'll start to see these ports come online. Great, so now we see that we have the little lightning bolts. That means it's 24 volt PoE, and hopefully it won't be too much longer before we start to see them orange. Now, the, the orange means it's 100 by 10. These do not have any gigabit ports on the cameras, but that's okay. Uh, we don't need that sort of throughput for these devices. So uh, this should shortly change over to orange. Excellent. So now we have these set to orange. That means that they're online. And now if I switch back to clients, and let's, uh, oh, we already are sorted by name. We can see all the other cameras have come online now. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So excellent. I have all of my cameras online and moving forward in our next videos we'll be diving into on how to configure the Unify video controller and adopting them for simplified management. I really hope you enjoyed this video and if you did please give this video a thumbs up below. I'm also working on some additional videos so make sure you hit that subscribe button and get notified once they are available. If you have any questions, I'd love to answer them. Just drop them down in the comments below or hit us up on Twitter. You can also help us keep the lights on by supporting us on Patreon. Thanks for watching. Looking forward to seeing you next time.